active, quite unquiet in my in terms, enter a luxury villa in Spain where the idea is to couple up romantically all in the goal of creating the perfect relationship. There's a lot of sexual references and in innuendo, some of which has been cut uh, from the New Zealand free-to-air viewing due to its early 5pm slot. It screens at 9 in the UK. Uh, one episode sees, for example, tempers flaring over Michael dumping Amber while viewers also witnessed the beginning of the end. Oh my gosh, I'm not there yet. Oh, oh spoil it. Whoops, I'm sorry about that. Look, child development expert Nathan Wallace says that this highly sexualised reality show and ones like it are turning children into adults, uh, making them grow up beyond their time, uh, uh, to quote journalist Kate Robinson. We're running out of time, so let's go to uh, Nathan first, a child development expert, Nathan Wallace. Kia ora, Nathan. Kia ora, how are you? All right, very, very well. So now, what is it about Love Island you have an issue with? I don't have an issue with it for teenagers because I think it's aimed at teenagers. Teenagers are in their limbic system, their frontal cortex is kind of shut for renovations, it's been happening for thousands of years in adolescence, and they are emotional and drama-driven and sexualised. Um, that's part of being a teenager. Um, so I've got no issue with them for teenagers. It's about programming time and about exposing eight-year-olds to that. The, the reason why it's blown up in the UK media is because there's lots of reports of eight-year-olds imitating the acts on Love Island on the playground. And so my thing is, oh, if no. it's worth the rating... Are you serious? Concerned. Yeah. So as it's I understand concerned. it, students as young as eight have been rating each other based on their looks, so being, being hot. Yeah, absolutely. And it encourages that culture. Um, and really, that's what I mean about taking away the innocence of childhood, that developmentally, children don't need exposed to that really early on. That's going to contribute to much higher levels of anxiety and depression and just you know, mental unwell-being. All right, Nathan, we're going to leave, leave it there for you because we're almost out of time. Um, but I want to jump in with Julia. What do you say about that? Um, well, speaking of eggplants, I just watched an episode where they had tearaway pants and they like pulled them off and jumped on a ball <laughs> and did like all of this stuff, very sexualised behaviour. And it was lols for me, who like sometimes wants to have a break from thinking. But I could see, um, I mean, Nathan's done a lot of work in this area. It's just probably not appropriate for younger children to be exposed to in five o'clock during the no. day. I would totally talk all that. But they, there's lots of, there was eggplants going around um, you know, it was just too much when I think about uh, children watching. So, Absolutely. total for Nathan. Yep. Okay. So, so you're a Love Island lover, but you do agree with it. What about this, Ben? I mean, uh, you, you've got you've got. Love I, Island I think being Nathan's acted out right. in the playground. No, Shocking. Nathan's absolutely right. Um, you know, worrying about body issues, feeling anxious over what you look like and how you feel in the world, mm. that you're, you're not pretty enough, that you're yep. not rich enough, that you don't have the right lifestyle, that should definitely wait until your teens. What? <laughs> <laughs> One no, mother said, that, I, I, the, I mean, the message is, one mother said, that being hot is the, the most important thing about them. That doesn't build young people up. And I'd agree with that. No, I Some agree. Some of them no, are really smart it's... too. One of the women's a scientist and she's got all this stuff, but they just show off the bodies and all of that. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, this is part of a wider kind of culture, you know, Instagram, that is, you know, melting young people's brains. Very good. Meanwhile, can you please stop texting about the eggplants? Uh, that's... <laughs> what happens on a panel, heaven knows. Uh, Julia Fakuri and Ben uh, Thomas, you have been fantastic this afternoon. Got Thank it. you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks to Ali. Check by next. I'm back tomorrow. See ya. This is Checkpoint on RNZ National. I'm Lisa Owen. Tonight, the ghost of payrolls past is back. Nova Pay means no pay rise anytime soon for teachers who are firing up the lawyers. A Matata resident sounds a warning to other coastal dwellers. Could Coromandel and Fitianga residents be the next forced to leave their homes? A craft store is accused of racial profiling. Not possible, they say. Find out why. And should Wellington's historic basin reserve be rebranded the Support Women's Sport Basin Reserve? Catchy or not so much? The government stopped short of forcing manufacturers to make furniture more fire resistant. Well, that sparked a debate. And the tiny house rental that's caused a big stink. 
RNZ News at five. Kia ora ko Susana Leata with the Residents of the Bay of Plenty coastal settlement of Matata have been told a managed retreat is the only option because of the danger of another flood. About 30 locals met in private with the Fakatani District Council last night to hear the latest plan for their futures and compensation offers for their properties. They've now been told they may get more time to consider the council offer to buy their at-risk properties. Sarah Robson has more. After 14 years of wrangling and uncertainty, the owners of 34 properties in an area deemed too dangerous after a debris flow in 2005 are being offered market value to sell up. Initially, they were told that once the offer process started, they would have a month to decide whether to take it up. But the council says that's going to be reviewed. It acknowledges that some people were angry and upset at the meeting, but says there were also residents who wanted to take the package up. The Whakatane Mayor, Tony Bond, says the risk to human life was the main reason why people needed to leave. Call Sarah Robson, aho. The PPTA says it's prepared to keep pushing legal action against Novapan even after pay increases won by teachers are paid out. The union and the NZEI have been told that Novapay won't be paying the new rates and back pay for union members, which took effect from July the 1st until September the 11th. The PPTA Vice President, Melanie Webber, says the reasons for the delay are unacceptable. It's more than possible that the legal action won't be concluded by that time, but what we need to do is send a clear signal to um, people that this is unacceptable. You cannot wait over two months to give people the pay increase that you've promised them. Melanie Webber. Education Payroll, which is in charge of Nova Pay, says never before has a payroll adjustment of this complexity been required. Its Chief Executive, Arlene White, says because teachers often have multiple roles, there are in total 139,000 individuals jobs requiring pay adjustment. The Automobile Association says the government needs to follow through with serious money if it's planned to radically cut the road tollers to work. A road safety strategy aims to cut road deaths by 40% in the next decade. It includes lowering speed limits, increasing spending on road safety infrastructure and improving the safety of vehicles entering the fleet. Mike Noon from the association says it's a very ambitious plan and it's going to take a huge effort to pull it off. The government, if they want this to work, need to strongly invest in road safety right through the life of this strategy because there's a lot of roads that need to have safety work done on them. There's a lot of work to do um, and it's, it's not going to be cheap. The strategy was released for consultation today and closes on August the 14th. A secret witness in the trial of a man accused of being a lookout in a violent dairy robbery has told a court he overheard the crime being planned. Ngātama Kainua is on trial in the High Court at Auckland, accused of keeping watch outside Greyland's Highlight Dairy, while a 16-year-old went into the store with a knife. Annika Smith reports. Siddhartha Patel was stabbed six times behind the dairy counter before the knife was turned on his mother, Geeta. This morning, a man who has name suppression told the court he overheard Mr Kai Inoue and the teenager talking about robbing a dairy to get money the day of the attack. He said he told the pair not to be idiots, but they left his house and the defendant returned 20 minutes later looking panicked. Mr Kai Inoue denies playing a role in the stabbing. His trial is due to wrap up this week. Atuiti ko te mātua ko Anika Smith ho. Passengers on flights between Auckland and Palmerston North the weekend before last are being warned they may have been exposed to measles. The Auckland Public Health Service says a passenger flew while infectious. Those flights are Air New Zealand from Auckland to Palmerston North at 7.20 in the morning on Saturday, July the 6th. And the return flight on Sunday, leaving Palmerston North at 2.30. Health officials say fellow passengers and anyone in Auckland or Palmerston North's domestic terminals about the time of the flights should watch for signs of measles. Three days of intermittent power cuts are going ahead in Ohakune despite a safety notice requiring people to boil water in the central plateau town. About 180 properties will be affected by the mid-winter maintenance cuts, but the Ruapehu District Council is assuring residents they will have enough drinking water and won't be left without electricity in the evenings. Days of heavy rain stirred up the region's drinking water, prompting the boil notice being issued on Monday. Council Chief Executive Clive Manley says the company wants to get the work done during the school holidays so it won't impact on a local school. It's coming up to five minutes past five.
The All Blacks halfback Aaron Smith is impressed with how well the backline has clicked in their first full training run in Buenos Aires. Chiefs halfback Brad Webber, Highlanders first five Josh Iwane and Crusaders outside backs Braden Enor, Sevu Reis and George Bridge were all involved in the session ahead of Sunday's rugby championship opener against Argentina. After limited training in Auckland before they left, Smith says the backline has immediately gelled. It looked pretty sharp to be honest, you know, going through the moves at full pace today. It was really exciting and good to see and a few young faces getting the opportunity. Obviously uh, no no defence coming yet but the timing of was great and the mixture of youth and experience was cool too. Meanwhile Sonny Bill Williams is in doubt for the match with Anton Leonard brown and Nganangi Laumape, a likely midfield combination. Cronulla are optimistic Sean Johnson will be fit in time for his first encounter with his former club, the Warriors in Wellington, Friday night. Johnson was in a moon boot after suffering an ankle injury in his side's last round to Melbourne, but took part in a light training run in Sydney yesterday before the side flew into Wellington. Paul Volta, Eliza McCartney has headed to Europe in an attempt to get her year back on track. McCartney's last or last competed in January, having had ongoing hamstring problems. McCartney will join up with a number of other New Zealand athletes at a camp in Cyprus in preparation for the World Championships in Doha at the end of September. That's the news. Reaching for the moon. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Words that echo through history. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Some encouragement for Baldwin Street. He was also saying, jokingly, just get a bit more Ashfeld and just build the street. That sounds like a Scotsman to me. <laughs> Aim high. Morning Report weekdays from 6, on air, online and on Facebook. Then on 9 to noon, Private Conservation Department is cracking down on rogue tour operators. And after 10, the passionate translators of The Little Prince fighting to preserve four of the world's most endangered languages. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after Morning Report on RNZ National. Now the short uh, uh, forecast, the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight tomorrow, Northland to Manawatu, including Coromandel, Bay of Plenty and Central High Country. Showers, some heavy, easing overnight and becoming isolated. Hauru Whenua, Kapiti Coast, Wellington and Wairarapa, fine weather apart from isolated showers. Possible thunderstorms about southern Wairarapa this evening. For Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, fine weather apart from isolated showers in Hawke's Bay tonight. Nelson, Marlborough and Canterbury, any remaining showers showers clearing this evening and becoming fine. Cloud increasing tomorrow with rain in Nelson tomorrow night. For Buller, Westland and Fiordland, isolated showers turning to rain tomorrow. Otago and Southland, mainly fine. Isolated showers about the south coast tonight and elsewhere from tomorrow afternoon. Chatham Islands, showers some heavy clearing by tomorrow morning. You're with RNZ National. And Dara Stewart is back at 5am with First Up, followed by Kim Hill joining Corin Dan on Morning Report. The time now, eight and a half past five. Thanks, Susanna. Right now, though, you are with Checkpoint, and my name's Lisa Owen. Novapay is back, haunting teachers and the Education Minister. Teachers' unions are planning legal action against the payroll provider for delaying teachers' pay increase, increases and back pay. That comes after the NZEI and PPTA uh, have been told that Novapay won't be paying the new rates and back pay for union members, which took effect from July the 1st until September the 11th. The Education Education ministers already tried and failed today to speed up the process after declaring the delay was just not good enough. Here's political reporter Charlie Drever. Education Minister Chris Hipkins tweeted last night that teachers had been asking why it was taking so long to get their pay rises, saying it was the first he'd heard about the delay. One teacher tweeted him saying, It's never ever taking two and a half months before. It's usually happening within four to six weeks, not 11 weeks. Chris Hipkins declared the delay wasn't good enough and he was meeting with the Education Ministry and Novo Pay representatives to address the matter. By this afternoon, the minister was back on Twitter with bad news for teachers. He wouldn't front for the media, instead his office released a one-paragraph statement. The Ministry of Education and Education Payroll Limited have canvas options to speed up the process so teachers can get their money sooner. I have, however, been advised that there are no quick solutions, even if we increase resources, due to the complexity of the payroll and the agreements. 
But PPTA Vice President Melanie Webber says the reasons for the delay are unacceptable. They've been negotiating these collective agreements for over a year. The fact that they're going to have to manage putting a pay increase into the system should not be news to anyone. So to have them suddenly scrambling round and deciding they can't do it is very problematic. Melanie Webber says teachers were expecting to receive their money earlier and they're facing a financial squeeze as a result. There's been a lot of upset from teachers on the Facebook page who um, had been expecting this to come through sooner and who feel that the government is taking the mickey and taking advantage of teachers. Both the primary and secondary unions are now speaking to lawyers to see what action they can take against the education payroll. Ms Webber says the PPTA is prepared to keep pushing legal action even after the pay increases are given out in September if need be. It's more than possible that the legal action won't be concluded by that time, but what we need to do is send a clear signal to um, people that this is unacceptable. You cannot wait over two months to give people the pay increase that you've promised them. NZEI National Secretary Paul Galter says Novopay has been quick to take money off teachers in the past. The strike action deductions happened in the next pay period. The, the, gov- the ministry got onto that straight away. So they seem to have found the resources to take money away from people, but they don't have, seem to have the resources or the interest to um, give them money to which they're entitled. Paul Galter says his union has also been kept in the dark about the delays. There was no communications to the union about these delays until right to the last moment. And so it's almost like the Ministry of Education has been sitting on this and trying to hide it. Hiding it or not, Chris Hipkins says work is underway to replace Novo Pay to help avoid a repeat in the future. Small comfort to those who still have another two months to wait until getting their backdated pay rises will finally hit their back pocket. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Core Charlie Drever, DNA. In a response sent to RNZ, Education Payroll, which is in charge of NovaPay, says there has never before been a payroll adjustment of this complexity. Its chief executive, Arlene White, says because teachers often have multiple roles, there are 139,000 individual jobs requiring pay adjustment. She says the current payroll system doesn't have the facility to easily make the complex adjustments required, so they're having to design, write and extensively test new code. And Ms White says a replacement payroll service that's being built called EdPay will allow much more flexibility and responsiveness in the future. Residents in the small Bay of Plenty town of Matata are gearing up for a legal battle to be able to stay in their beachside homes. The Whakatane District Council has essentially given them an ultimatum. Sell up at market rate or prepare for the land that you live on to be rezoned so it's uninhabitable. Now it comes after a massive amount of debris washed down into the settlement in 2005, destroying six homes at the base of the Awatarariki fan head. After the $20 million a clean-up was complete, the council told people they would be able to mitigate future risks and that they could continue living there. They've since backtracked and say the risk is too great and shifting people away is the only option. Residents say that's rubbish and they want to be able to decide their own future. Our reporter Nita Blake-Person and cameraman Nick Munro are in Matata. Rob Pierce has lived in Matata for more than 20 years and for 14 of them he's been dealing with constant uncertainty about the future of his home. I mean I get stressed. I'm on Champix at the moment trying to give up smoking but I'm puffing more than bloody what I usually do. He's one of dozens of Matata residents who were last night told they would receive market rates for their homes if they leave. That's all it's about, about taking the liability off them. And whether it ruins a person's life, well, that's just part of the game. The way I look at it is um, you've got um, 19 houses, and I'm talking about the um, container houses as well. And if you average, say, three people per house, that's 60 to 80 people that have got to migrate out of Matata because there's no houses in Matata ready for sale, let alone rentals. Um, Wakatani and Ahopi, I'm oh, well, not even going to mention Ahopi, but Wakatani is the same. Uh, rentals around New Zealand are hard to get. So where do all those people go? And then you've got their jobs. So to me, 
it's probably going to be a six year process of it going through all the bullshit, but that's six years with a roof over our head. Rob Pierce says it wouldn't have mattered what price the council offered. He doesn't want to leave his home and doesn't believe he should have to. The Whakatane District Council disagrees. If we gave you right to stay there, what about the people that visit you? What about the grandchildren that come? So, therefore, we are responsible and we cannot get out of that. So, um, that was considered. Whakatane District Mayor Tony Bond says he understands someone to stay on their properties at all costs, but the council isn't prepared to let them do that. It will apply for a change under the Resource Management Act later this year to have the land Rob Pierce and other residents have their homes on redesignated from residential to a reserve. Bottom line, that means no one can build or live there. We're not going to actually use any big stick. So we're going in with the package. It's a very fair package, and I would think I would think the more the majority will take that package up in the end, and we'll just have to wait and see because they're prepared to take that through the courts and they want to put their case forward. The council last night told residents they had a month to consider the offer, but is considering extending that. Council representatives at the meeting said a handful of the 34 property owners who received the offer had already indicated they were interested in selling up. Tawai Thatcher has lived in Matata for four years. She says she will consider the council's offer if it gives her a fair price. I'm open to listening to them, I am. But in the, uh, I don't trust them. If they offer what I pay for it again four years later, I won't be taking that. But she accepts she's in a much easier position to move than others. I we're originally from Gisborne, so um, there's not that uh, emotional tie. In the, sa- in the same token, I do love it here, and I wish I didn't have to move and, and be in that position. And I love my neighbours, you know, in the, this little spot. Um, but if the, if the council come with the right off, we, we may have to move here. Yeah. Rob Pierce won't be going so easily and says if the council do manage to change the law to take their land away from them, their effects will be felt well beyond their backyard. Jesus, it's going to set a big precedent for the rest of New Zealand. And, I mean, you've got councils waiting for this. You've got places like um, Coromandel and Wittianga that if this goes through, it's going to make it a lot easier for them. You know, if it's going to cost too much, it's easier just to get rid of people. But he's not banking on that happening anytime soon. Uh, we've been through two mayors, three CEOs, and we're still going. So those, the, um, the mayor will be leaving this year. I don't know how long the CEO will hang around, and we'll just keep going. In Matata for Checkpoint, Nita Blank person. And it's almost 18 past five. You're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Let us know what you think of that. Should the residents in Matata be able to stay on at their own risk or is it the council's responsibility to look out for their safety? I also wonder what it means for other people who are living in seaside areas where they might be prone to the elements as well. You can text us on 2101 with your thoughts. Tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. A Māori woman is accusing a craft store, Lincraft, of racial profiling after she was accused of stealing cross-stitch from one of its shops in Christchurch. This happened as her partner was buying said cross-stitch at the front counter. And the woman says the response she's had from Lindcraft management isn't good enough. But Lindcraft denies any allegation of racial profiling. Logan Church has the story. River Jaden got a lot more than she bargained for when she paid a visit to the Lincraft Bushin over the weekend. So on Sunday, my partner was shopping in Lincraft, and I went in, spoke to a lady there, asked her where the cross stitch section was to find my partner. She gave me an awful look, showed me. We're in the store for probably about oh, maybe three minutes, and then my partner got cross stitched. We went into the queue, out the phone rang, and so I'd spoken on the phone, went out the front of the store. And while I was at the front of the store, my partner heard this lady on the phone to the manager and saying that I'd stolen cross-stitch and that I needed to be investigated and she the cameras out on me in front of my partner, who was clearly buying the cross-stitch that she was kind of implying that I'd stolen. Outraged, Ms Jaden went to the manager, who she says responded very well and was apologetic. But she says the employee wasn't and defended her actions, telling Ms Jaden theft was a common problem for them. And River Jaden believes there was clearly a racial undertone. 
Well, to me, it looked like racial profiling. Like, it was, it was absolutely nothing other than that. You know, I was walking around the store. I don't think I looked like I was going to steal anything. I didn't barely touch anything. Um, I didn't have a bag or, you know, what would typically look like someone who was stealing. And she heard me on the phone. I indicated I was on the phone, and I walked out of the shop. So, to me... I just, it was such a shock, you know, like I was just a normal person walking through Lincraft. There's nothing, nothing different. The reason why I felt so frustrated and angered about it is that I spoke to the lady about racial profiling and being prejudiced and judgmental and no apology to me, no apology, no, no apology to my partner. River Jaden says she just wants an official apology as she thinks her message did not get through to the employee in question. After Ms Jaden left the store, she sent Lincraft a message on Facebook, which Checkpoint has seen. Lincraft responded saying they were sincerely sorry for Ms Jaden's experience at the store. But speaking to Checkpoint from the company headquarters in Australia, their chief legal officer, Brian Swirsky, denied any racial profiling. Although he did say things could have been handled better. At the outset, we, we vehemently deny the allegation of, uh, of racial prejudice or, or, or being racist. Um, that is certainly not the, the values that our company espouses or the values we espouse to our staff. Um, ha having, having said that, uh, the staff member concerned probably could have handled her concerns in a far better and far more discreet way. And Brian Swirsky says an investigation is underway. Just being investigated at the moment, I, I haven't uh, actually had a counselling session with the, the person concerned because I'm in Australia, but we will do that, and if we believe appropriate disciplinary action is needed or we believe appropriate counselling or further education or training is needed for the staff member, we will act accordingly. Um, but to suggest that our organisation is racist is, is downright insulting. I'm personally Jewish, so I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitive to these sorts of allegations, um, and uh, we just don't accept it. Brian Swirsky is inviting River Jaden, who we referred to as Jaden in our interview, to a sit-down meeting with Lincraft Management to discuss what happens. If you're speaking to, to Jaden, then please make contact with the store. Please come in, sit down with us uh, in a neutral venue if she, needs, if she, she prefers, with whoever she wants to be there. But let's have a sensible discussion about her concerns legitimate concerns. I'm not downplaying her concerns. We empathise with uh, her and, and, and what she said, but as I said, vehemently deny from the point of view of an organisation any racist overtones or any, any suggestion that there's any policy to, to target any particular ethnic group. River Jaden says she is more than happy to attend a sit-down meeting. I would meet with them. I would like some sort of communication. That would be great. Um, they said they'd email me. They haven't. She says Lincraft has her email address and knows how to get hold of her. Kei o te tahi a hau mo te hōtaka o te ahi ahi nei. Ko Logan Church tēnei. Drone users might soon need a licence to fly one and could be pinged by the police or have them seized if they break the law. The government's looking at a broad range of drone regulations to help the commercial sector grow and protect airports and citizens from unlawful uses. It believes the industry could be worth $7.9 billion to the economy. Reporter Jordan Bond and video journalist Dan Cook have this report. Get used to hearing about drones. Last year, 50 times more drones were used in New Zealand than there are even planes in the country. That's a quarter of a million drones already, and there will only be more in our skies as they become cheaper and technology develops. The Transport Minister, Phil Twyford, says in the coming decades, almost every economic sector will benefit from them, and recreational uses will increase. But he says with great benefits comes the potential for harm, and they have to plan now for the future. A range of measures are being considered, including the possibility of mandatory registration for drone users and for drones themselves, electronic identification of drones and pilot competency requirements for people flying drones. Measures such as geofencing and remote identification are also being considered to mitigate the risks that drones pose, particularly around airports. UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, can fertilise farms, spray gorse and herd livestock. They can also help search and rescue operations in tricky terrain and inspect high-rise buildings, power lines and bridges. 
Amazon has trials to deliver packages autonomously by drone, aiming for express drop-offs in America in 30 minutes or less. But some potentially catastrophic risks have already been seen here. Hobbyists getting in the way of planes and helicopters. All around the world, um, after the Gatwick incident last summer, um, airports and uh, civil aviation authorities are grappling with this. So there are um, a number of tools. Geofencing is, uh, technology is moving quite rapidly. Um, and there is the ability to use electronic means to uh, interfere with or land a drone that is uh, in airspace where it shouldn't be. But we're going to have to... Um, our challenge now is to tap into rapidly advancing technology internationally, to stay in touch with all of the international authorities so we can get the best of what's being done uh, globally and then make that part of a comprehensive regulatory regime here. Commercial operators, people flying at night or those with large drones already have to be certified. But the government doesn't know who buys and flies off-the-shelf drones which makes laws hard to enforce. There would have to be uh, a regime of, of clear rules uh, with penalties and a, and a compliance regime. There's too, there's too much at stake here uh, uh, not to have some kind of serious enforcement regime. Airways manages airspace and navigation for our airports. The CEO, Graham Sumner, says the thing everyone's concerned about is a collision between a drone and a plane, and there have already been near misses. He says a collision is a very low risk, but the consequences are large. Mr Sumner says they have a world-leading drone detection system in place, but the technology is not perfect yet. I think we've got good uh, systems in place to manage. It's just that at the moment it's very inefficient. When we know there's a drone in the space, what we're having to do is close the airports for 15 minutes to ensure that they're out of the airspace and that we have a, a free landing area. And that's not desirable. You want to be able to keep the airport open, see where the, where the drone is and notify the relevant authority. Mr Twyford says some problems can be solved by educating users. Airshare is the drone information hub in New Zealand and has an app which shows where aircraft are and lets drone users log flight requests. Its chief executive, Trent Fulcher, says drone regulation is in its early days and regulation is constantly evolving. I think what we're talking about is how can we educate someone with the, bare, the, the, the basics of how to fly safely at the point of purchase. Uh, and other jurisdictions around the world are doing that when, uh, when you buy, buy a drone in the store, you download the app, you do your training on the spot, and some of the benefits of the drone ac actually aren't unlocked until you're able to pass the test. So there's some really great uses of kind of, kind of gamifying the technology to uh, embed training in the experience and so that people start flying safely from the beginning. Mr Twyford says regulation is a balance between supporting the industry's clear potential for growth and managing safety and privacy issues that will crop up. He says they'll now seek feedback from the industry and the public and hope to have regulations put forward in the next year. I tamaki makoto mō te hōtaka o te ahi ahi nei, ko Jordan Bond tēnei. And if you were listening to that one on the drive home, do go back online and you can check out Jordan and Dan's story there. You can see the Transport Minister's drone flying technique. It'll be up on our website and our Facebook page. Jewish community leaders joined Muslim officials in Christchurch today to hand over a million dollars for the victims of the Christchurch mosque attacks. Following the March 15 shootings, the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh raised more than $900,000 for Christchurch Muslims. The act of generosity was inspired after Muslims rallied around the Jewish community when an armed shooter opened fire in a synagogue in Pittsburgh, killing 11 people in October last year. At a lunchtime ceremony, the New Zealand Jewish Council president handed over a cheque to the Christchurch Foundation to establish the Abrahamic Fund. Christchurch reporter Nicholas Poynton filed this report. For members of the Muslim and Jewish faith, today's ceremony was much more than just a transfer of money from one faith to another. It was an opportunity to explore the other's religion, which is so closely aligned to their own, as they visited each community's place of worship. For Canterbury Hebrew congregation member Yasmin Sellers, her first time inside a mosque was an opportunity for comparison. Obviously seen it in movies and television before. Um, all I was doing is just comparing how do we do things and the first thing is like, there's no chairs. Chairs aside, the visits saw Muslims and Jews realise just how many similarities they shared. 
Federation of Islamic Associations New Zealand spokesperson Dr Anwar Ghani's first time in a synagogue was an experience he thinks both communities can learn from. Many similarities between the two faith groups is just unreal and uh, this is also something which we need to be promoting within our own communities that people visiting each other places of worship so that we improve understanding about each other. After their respective visits, both groups join Christchurch Mayor Leanne Dalzell for lunch and the launch of the Abrahamic Fund. During her address, the 30 or so people gathered in the Mayor's Lounge collectively nodded their heads when Miss Dalzell said the donation was an extraordinary gift. The world will remember the response uh, long after they will remember uh, the person that committed this atrocity, uh, but they will never forget those um, whose lives were so cruelly taken on that day. New Zealand Jewish Council President Stephen Goodman signed the document to establish the new fund. He says the Christchurch Foundation will allocate the fund's money according to the needs of families affected by the attack. The purposes we have defined are, are not necessarily complete because we, no one knows what the needs are for the community, but it's looking long term uh, and things like education, uh, medical needs, uh, counselling, um, financial advice and planning, uh, and also to improve Jewish Muslim relations. New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies Chief Executive Vic Aladef travelled from Australia to deliver close to $70,000 worth of money raised by Jews living in the state. He says it would have been easy to simply transfer the money, but he wanted his presence to send a message. I want you to come on behalf of the Jewish Board of Deputies to physically stand here and say, we, we did this because we cared. And that's why I wanted to come here and make a symbolic, have a symbolic presence to show that we care, that we're all members of one shared humanity. Today's agreement signed by the Jewish Council and the Christchurch Foundation acknowledges that any allocation of funds will consider the interests of Muslims. The foundation will now begin to engage Christchurch's Islamic community to identify areas where support is needed. For Checkpoint, Nicholas Poynton. Checkpoint on RNZ National. What to do about flammable furniture? Should we rename the Basin Reserve? How does the Support Women's Sport Basin Reserve sound? It's quite hard to say that fast. And the big stink over the tiny house rental. Let us know your thoughts on anything you've heard on the programme today. You can text us on 2101, tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Time to go to the headlines with Susanna now. Residents of the Bay of Plenty coastal settlement of Matata have been told a managed retreat is the only option because of the danger of another flood. Locals met the Fakatane District Council last night to hear the latest plan for their futures and compensation offers for their properties. They've now been told they may get more time to consider offers for their at-risk properties. The PPTA says it is prepared to keep pushing legal action against Novapay, even after pay increases won by teachers are paid out. Teachers have been told Novapay will be delaying paying the new rates and back pay for union members for more than two months. The PPTA says the reasons for the delay are unacceptable. Education Payroll, which is in charge of Novapay, says dealing with the pay adjustment is complicated. A witness in the trial of a man accused of being a lookout in a violent dairy robbery in Auckland has told a court he overheard the crime being planned. Ngātama Kaienua is accused of keeping watch outside Greyland's Highlight Dairy while a 16-year-old went into the store with a knife and two people were stabbed. A man who has name suppression told the High Court Mr Kaienua and the teenager talked about robbing a dairy hours before the attack and he later saw the defendant looking panicked. The Wellington City Council is backing a campaign spearheaded by some of the country's top female athletes to temporarily rename the Basin Reserve the Support Women Sport Basin Reserve. The campaign launched today aims to raise $100,000 for the Basin naming rights for two years to highlight inequalities in women's sport. Wellington City Councillor Fleur Fitzsimmons says renaming the Basin would help counter the discrimination and sexism faced by women in sport. The Automobile Association says the government needs to follow through with serious money if its plan to radically cut the road toll is to work. 
A road safety strategy aims to cut road deaths by 40% in the next decade. The AA's Mike Noon says it's a very ambitious plan and it's going to take a huge effort to pull it off. Those are the latest news headlines on RNZ National. Our next news and weather update is at 6. Thanks, Susanna. If you're just joining us, this is Checkpoint and time now for business news with Kim Savage. Hey, Kim, the Inter-Climate Change Committee, they think the government should focus on electric vehicles rather than focusing on getting to a 100% renewable electricity target. So, I mean, what does the electricity sector think of that? Uh, breathing a sigh of relief, I think it's safe to say. So, of course, we had this uh, report out from that in- interim climate change committee and there was the report out on the emission side of things, which, of course, affects farmers and the like. And then there was this report into... Uh, the electricity sector and the, and the future of an, an accelerating electrification so you know things like electric vehicles and things. The other thing that this uh, report focused on also was process heat too which was looking at the uh, industrial heating processes so say uh, a dairy company for example uh, changing milk powder into uh, liquid and so on and, and using heating uh, that's driven by fossil fuels and so what this report has come out and said is that it would actually be better if the government focused on those things, the electric vehicles getting more of those cars on the road and also uh, focusing on moving some of those uh, heating processes away from fossil fuels and into electrification. And it's said it's better off making those a priority than focusing on that target of 100% renewable electricity by 2035. My gosh, that's a mouthful. What the report did say is that we're already on track to reach about 97% by that time frame anyway, so the, the industry itself, the whole the sort of electricity sector is doing pretty well in that regard, but that it's not necessarily the, the 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 way to achieve the targets that the, the government wants to achieve by focusing solely on that goal. The government came out and said that it won't die, and to quote the Energy Minister Megan Woods, won't die in a ditch over a couple of a percent. So it is happy to then take the focus and look at some of these other things and perhaps, you know, not get too upset about maybe a, a couple of percent perhaps not reaching that goal. So we talked today to Mercury, uh, one of the major players in that uh, electricity generation and retail space, said that they welcomed this very pragmatic approach from the government, not being wedded to that target necessarily at this stage, and said that there will be a significant investment required. The main problem with reaching that 100% target is you have these things called hydro dry years, which is something unique to New Zealand. Of course, you've got your hydro storage lakes, and if you end up with a year where you don't get a lot of rain, then of course that impacts on the electricity that can be generated from that. So that is one of the gaps here in actually achieving that goal, as identified by the report, and it's something the industry has been talking about for a long time. So they're saying that yes, that investment in in, uh, dealing with that problem will come and essentially it means you need larger or more storage lakes to deal with that problem. Yes, that investment will come but it will come in time and perhaps uh, from Mercury's point of view being obsessed with a a time frame getting this achieved 100% by 2035 is not necessarily the best way to handle it. Okay, let's move on to the big social media companies. Now, they've fronted up to US lawmakers. What are they saying? Well, yeah, I have to say the response that they got there at uh, at committees over in Washington were not particularly particularly complimentary. So uh, Facebook was obviously the main one there that was appearing, actually had to defend uh, its launch of its digital coin, which is the cryptocurrency Libra, which it announced uh, last month that it was going to introduce next year. Uh, So some of the words that were bandied about uh, delusional and crazy from some senators there said that Facebook's demonstrated through scandals that it doesn't deserve our trust and that would be crazy to give them the chance to let them experiment with people's bank accounts too. So not the greatest reception for Facebook there talking to US lawmakers. So the fear here that they have is is the unknown really. Since that announcement last month, regulators and governments around the world have been mulling this over and thinking what would a digital cryptocurrency on the scale that Facebook is talking about, this is a, an organisation with 2.38 mil, bil, excuse me, billion users, and uh, they, um, if, if all of those people were to adopt this currency, could this then end up upending the financial system? There is a, a risk here, I guess, because this Libra currency could avoid the banking system altogether and then that becomes a risk thing to government-backed currencies. So it takes some of the control out of the hands of the regulators and puts that control 
potentially in Facebook or in Facebook's organisation that's going to be running this currency. So the fear or concern that some of these US lawmakers have is around how is Facebook going to protect consumers, not only their data, but also their money, essentially, too? How are they going to deal with the anti-money laundering uh, side of things? So, you know, protecting the the the, the system from being used by criminals to, to launder their money. Uh, also... Um, it seems apparent here from these US lawmakers and the reception they gave Facebook is that there is a certain amount of irritation there that, that perhaps they weren't consulted or there was no con- consultation with any regulators anywhere before Facebook actually launched launched this last month. Facebook has said it is going to engage on this and it is not going to go forward and, and, and uh, present anything final until it has had those conversations. So it's apparent there's still a bit of convincing to do in Washington and probably certainly other parts of the world too. Kevin, shall we take a quick twirl around the markets before you head off? Yes, indeed. Bit of a flat finish for our, our own NZX top 50 index. Uh, just th- just four points up at 10,655. And taking a look at the currency, the New Zealand dollar at 67 US cents and 95.7 Australian. Lisa. Thanks, Kim. That's Kim Savage joining us from our Wellington studio for your business today. The government wants furniture manufacturers and retailers to make their products safer and more fire resistant, but hasn't committed to regulating the industry. Consumer Affairs Minister Chris Farfoy released a product safety policy statement today, which sets out guidelines and a benchmark for fire resistance, which furniture should meet. But Retail New Zealand is warning a lack of regulation will create an uneven playing field among retailers and manufacturers. Katie Scotcher reports. It didn't take long for flames to spread inside a shipping container set up like a small living room at Auckland's Whanua Pai Air Base this morning. Just on 1 minute 40, you are starting to get quite a lot of smoke build up um, higher. That's going to be getting very hot, would be very unhealthy um, breathing any of that. After two minutes, thick black toxic smoke was billowing out of the container and was carried by the strong Auckland wind. Three minutes in, things really escalated. The windows started to explode. Okay, we've got fire coming out into the smoke. That's because there's just not enough oxygen inside to burn that, um, that smoke. It's now finding the old fire triangle and finding oxygen outside. If this was inside your house, this would be going down your hall, this would be going into other bedrooms, under other areas, and um, that room's unsurvivable. Six minutes later, all that was left inside the charred room was a melted couch and remnants of burnt stuffed animals. The furniture used in today's demonstration, like most modern furniture, was made using polyurethane foam, which ignites quickly and gives off toxic fumes. Fire and Emergency identified foam-filled furniture as the leading cause of fire spreading in homes. Peter Wilding says they've been working on combating the risk for four years. We have about 3,500 house fires a year in New Zealand and almost all of them uh, where they are involved in uh, with polyurethane foam which is typically in your, in your couches gets involved you get tremendous very fast rapid fire spread. Consultation began last year and now the Consumer Affairs Minister Chris Farfoy has asked the furniture industry to work together to try and find ways to make their products safer in a fire. We've got a two year window where officials and fiends uh, will be able to work with um, those who make the furniture, uh, who sell the furniture and importantly consumers to make sure that consumers have got the information to know that there is going to be an alternative and also that we can work with the sector to make sure that we increase what we can do to make sure that there's much more or flame retardant foam going into um, the furniture. Mr Farfoy says it's possible any added industry costs could be passed on to consumers. That's why it's important to have that two-year window to work with manufacturers and retailers to understand what technology they may have to introduce to make the furniture safer. Retail NZ Chief Executive Greg Harford says it's good the government is trying to improve fire safety in people's homes, but he says regulation is needed. It means that there's not a level playing field for everyone in the furniture business. So uh, some people will choose to comply. Those um, good corporate citizens who want to try and do the right thing will do their very best um, to try
try and improve their, their products and the labelling that's on them, um, but not everyone is forced to do so, and that does create an issue because it means that not everyone's playing by the same rules necessarily. Chris Farfoy wouldn't say if regulations will ever be introduced. Making things mandatory is difficult because technology changes and flame retardants change and you have to change things along as you go. I think the better way uh, is to balance that and working with the sector retailers and manufacturers to see what's possible for them. The Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment has been tasked with monitoring the furniture industry's uptake of the product safety policy statement over the next two years. I tamaki makaurau mo te hotaka o te ahiahi nei, ko Katie Scott Shiraho. And Katie's story will go up on our Facebook page and our website. It's really remarkable how quickly that furniture goes up in flames. You'll want to check it out. Uh, time for some of your feedback now. Let's go back to an earlier story that we ran about the Matata residents who have been offered a buyout for their properties. These are the ones that the council says are at risk from the elements after earlier flooding. Deborah has been in touch and says the health and safety laws strike again. With the residents in the flood zone, this is over the top. People should be able to choose the risks they are prepared to take and suffer or benefit from the consequences of those choices. Too much government, says Deborah. Someone else has got in touch to say, yep, the council is liable. They should have to pay out, as all councils should have to, to buy or protect properties they have collected rates on. However, if people want to waive the payments, they should be allowed to at their own risk. Unless council's payments are insufficient or the council is somehow behaving or has behaved improperly. And on a totally different subject, this is Logan Church's story about a woman who has accused Lindcraft, a craft store in Christchurch, of racially profiling her. Uh, This from a texter who says, being Māori in New Zealand, uh, it is just a fact of living in New Zealand to be racially profiled. I was pulled over 18 times in one year because I drove an AMG Mercedes. The worst part of being racially profiled is that New Zealanders think they aren't racist. I've lived all over the world, this person says. The most racist place I have been to is New Zealand. Ask any Māori person. Let me know what you think. Do you agree or disagree and why? Text us on 2101 or you can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or good old-fashioned email is always enjoyed. Checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Let's go to the South Island now. A Wanaka man has been forced to take down a rental ad for a teeny tiny house after critics slammed him for what they see as the oversized rent he was asking for it. The owner, Thomas uh, Shatovitz, is unapologetic and says people simply don't understand the Wanaka rental market that services a number of workers on temporary visas. And he says if he was a single man, he'd happily live in the three and a half metre by two metre cabin indefinitely. So I asked him to describe the tiny house in more detail. It's a tiny house that I've built over the course of a year uh, from leftover building materials that I have. And initially I didn't have any idea what I would do with it. Um, And it's come in very handy for me to live in and for renting out. It's more like a bespoke cabin with recycled dreamer trims. It looks like a, a ship's berth in an old boat, you know, so it's, it, it's quite different. So size-wise and facilities, can you tell me a bit about that? OK. Uh, it isn't big. Um, it is on a trailer carriage, and inside it's three and a half metres long and two metres wide and it's 2.8 metres high. And initially, I wasn't going to buy that trailer. It was an unfinished project, because I thought it was too small. And then I saw a YouTube video of a guy who had the same footprint, and he got in his tiny house everything I wanted in mine. And then I got it and got working on it, and it works. It's got bedding for three. It's got gas kitchen, running hot and cold water. It's got a separate compartment uh, for a shower and a toilet. But I'm not using that at the moment because it's more comfortable to go into the house for that. Uh, That's used as a wardrobe right now. Okay, so any tenant has to use the bathroom in the main house, is that right? They could choose to go and stay in the tiny house, but it's not really that comfortable. Okay, so what's the rent? What's the going rent for a house that's three and a half metres long and two metres wide? Well, you get stuck up on the size. It's not the size that matters in this instance. It's the self-contained studio. 
Uh, and obviously, uh, uh, one that's in a house and that is bigger, they go for three, 300 to 360 in Wanaka. Um, and this one is sort of in between a room and a shared house and a self-contained studio. Um, and I would say I'm right on the market because whenever I have somebody move out and somebody move in, um, I have quite a few people interested. So at what price level? What price point for yours? At, at the 250 And uh, I prefer to have a single person in there. Um, I put 290 for two people, but I really turn people away because I think it isn't suitable for two. Um, I would do that if I can't find a single person only, and that's not really what I want. I haven't had to do that ever. I know you think people are hung up on the size, but size does matter when you're living somewhere, and three and a half metres by two metres doesn't even seem like a tiny house. It sounds like a teeny tiny house or Mm. a closet or a wardrobe, that kind of size. Well, I lived in it it all autumn, and I moved back into it after after the winter. I mean, I'm renting myself, so it actually helps me to afford the rent for a small two-bedroom house. I've got a son who has to be homeschooled due to behavioural problems, and in winter it's just not really feasible to live in that, uh, in that tiny house, but in summer, spring and autumn it is. What do you think your core market, or who is, who is the person that you're appealing to here? Who would this home appeal right. to? Uh, the people who rent this tiny house, are actually not affected by that crisis because they have invariably been working holiday visa holders who really love being here, who earn a wage, who can still have a good life, who expect to pay two to two hundred and fifty for their accommodation over the winter. So, Thomas, do you see this um, tiny house that you're renting as being perfect for those short-term, relatively short-term rentals of workers coming into the area? At that size, I would say that's all it's good for, unless, like, as I said, I am happy to live in it myself. It depends on your personal needs. And people who always lived in houses cannot imagine that it's actually cool to live mostly outdoors and only go into the box for sleeping. So that's Thomas Shatovitz there with his tiny house, teeny tiny house, actually. Let me know, do you reckon it's value for the money? As he says, is it the best life to live outside and just go to sleep in the box? Let me know your thoughts. Text on 2101, tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. It is nine minutes away from six. And, of course, this is Checkpoint on RNZ National. Uh, Let's go now overseas. The head of the most popular e-cigarette brand in the US has apologised to parents whose children have become hooked on vaping. Juul has had exponential growth since its founding in 2015 and is now valued at more than $20 billion. It holds a whopping 70% of the US e-cigarette market and will be introduced to the New Zealand market later this year. And while the company bills itself as a smoking alternative for adults, critics say much much of its meteoric rise has been from sales to minors. Foreign editor Graham Acton reports. In the US, Juul is everywhere, easily available and hugely popular with teenagers who are attracted to its sweet, fruity flavours. Its popularity with the young has attracted attention from US health authorities and in San Francisco, where the company is based, it's likely Juul will be among e-cigarettes banned next year. Juul Chief Executive Kevin Burns was asked by US network CNBC what he would say to a parent of a teenager who had been using his product. First of all, I tell them that I'm sorry that they're child's using the product. It's not intended for them. Uh, I hope there was nothing that we did that made it appealing to them. As a parent of a 16-year-old, I'm sorry for them and I have empathy for them in terms of what the challenges are going through. Dual e-cigarettes cannot legally be sold to children in the US and the company has long maintained its products are for adults who wish to quit regular cigarettes. But critics say vaping is just another form of nicotine addiction promoted by a huge corporate that doesn't really care. Meredith Berkman is a New York mother of four involved with the lobby group Parents Against Vaping. I don't hear any acceptance of responsibility uh, or uh, taking you know, accountability for creating the youth vaping epidemic. 
If you're really sorry, take all the flavours off the market. Just one of the pods that users insert into Juul e-cigarettes contains as much nicotine as a packet of cigarettes. However, Juul CEO Kevin Burns admits the long-term effect of the product making billions for his company had not been properly investigated. We have not done the long-term longitudinal clinical testing that we need to do. For years, Juul and its competitors have run an e-cigarette market in the US without the approval of the Food and Drug Administration. The FDA says companies will now have until next May to gain approval for their products. FDA Acting Commissioner Ned Sharpless says e-cigarette companies are now on notice. We cannot allow the next generation of young people to become addicted to nicotine because of e-cigarettes. And the FDA stands ready to accelerate the review of e-cigarettes and other new tobacco products. The last boss of the FDA was Scott Gottlieb, and he says the US faces a massive public health crisis as e-cigarette use continues to grow in popularity with young Americans. We're going to have to look at uh, more draconian measures, like potentially taking these pod-based products off the market entirely. Like Juul, for like example. Like Juul, exactly. It's the cartridge-based products that the kids are using. Like I said to the companies, the youth data goes up again this year sharply. We will have to consider the marketability uh, of this entire category of products, and I've told them that. The US Senate is considering raising the tobacco purchasing age to 21 nationwide to discourage teen vaping and nicotine addiction. More than a dozen states have already raised the age. For Checkpoint, co Graham Acton, 10 And Guy on Espiner's online series Smoke and Mirrors canvases those issues in depth. A series of events have been taking place to mark 50 years to the day since the first manned mission to the moon. Apollo 11 took off from Cape Canaveral in 1969, carrying astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins in the culmination of the race to the moon kicked off by President John Kennedy a decade earlier. The BBC's Jane O'Brien reports. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. 500 million people around the world watched the launch of Apollo 11. But only the three men on board knew what it was actually like to ride the power of a massive rocket to the moon. To celebrate the 50th anniversary, astronaut Michael Collins described how it felt. As you ascend very slowly, majestically inside, it's a different situation. You feel jiggling left to right, and uh, you're not quite sure whether those jiggles are as big or small as they should be. The anniversary of Apollo 11 has reignited enthusiasm in the U.S. for a return to the moon. President Trump says he wants to put people back on the surface in 2024 to create a base for further exploration to Mars. But there are questions about the cost and purpose of such a mission, the same questions that bedeviled the Apollo 11 mission. Fifty years later, though, only the achievement is being celebrated. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. A campaign kicks off today to rebrand the historic Basin Reserve as the Support Women's Sport Basin Reserve. Zoe George reports. The name change proposal has some high-profile backing from the New Zealand Olympic Committee's Women in Sport Leadership Academy and Wellington Mayor Justin Lester. Olympic heptathlete Sarah Cowley-Ross says women's sport only receives about 10% of the media coverage. She says to have a name like Support Women's Sport Basin Reserve will send a message to young athletes. To have change, you need bold action, and it's more than just raising the profile of sports women. It's about actually, what are we providing for our young girls in the future, girls and boys, for them to see strong female role models? Why do we need to do that? Well, we can't be what we can't see. The advertising agency 81 has launched a crowdfunding campaign to secure the naming rights of the Basin Reserve. 81 spokesperson Jason Wells says about $100,000 needs to be raised to secure the rights for two years. We've got a a site that will go live later on today. We're going to try and push as many contacts as we possibly can and hopefully get it out there so people can donate, whether it's $5, $50, $500 or $5,000. 
anything would be would be fantastic. You figure if Israel Folau can get a whole lot of donations, then we, we reckon we've got a chance. Jason Wells says the group aims to raise the funds within the next 17 days. The Basin Reserve is owned by Wellington City Council, but managed and promoted by the Basin Reserve Trust, while Cricket Wellington takes care of day-to-day operations. Wellington City Councillor and Basin Reserve Trust member Fleur Fitzsimmons says if the money comes through, the name change will go ahead. By renaming the Basin Reserve to the Support Women Sport Basin Reserve, I just think we'll be sending a really important message to girls and women across the world that in Wellington we really value the role of women in sport. I think Wellingtonians are really conscious that there's a lot of sexism and discrimination in New Zealand sport and renaming the Basin Reserve would really be one step towards the better promotion and celebration of women in sport. Women in Sport Aotearoa Chief Executive Rachel Froggart also supports the name. To see such an iconic sporting venue change its name would just be such an exciting way and no, no doubt create quite a stir. What I love about this campaign is that I'm hoping it will actually stir up quite a conversation around women's sports. So there's going to be lots of people that have different views on whether this is a good idea or not a good idea, but the conversation is such an important one to have. Wellington Mayor Justin Lester also supports the initiative. In a statement to RNZ, he says he looks forward to the day when the nation's daughters can achieve the same level of personal and financial success in their chosen sport as our sons. For Checkpoint, Zoe George. RNZ News at 6. Nga mihi nui ko Susana lay ata with the NA. The PPTA says teachers were expecting to get the money from their pay increase by now and are facing financial burden as a result. The union and the NZEI have been told that Novopay won't be paying the new rates and back pay for union members, which took effect from July the 1st until September the 11th. PPTA Vice President Melanie Webber says the reasons for the delay are unacceptable. There's been a lot of upset from teachers on the Facebook page who um, had been expecting this to come through sooner and who feel that the government is taking the mickey and taking advantage of teachers. Both the unions are now speaking to lawyers to see what action they can take. Education Payroll, which is in charge of Novapay, says because teachers often have multiple roles, there are in total 139,000 individual jobs requiring pay adjustment. Residents of the Bay of Plenty coastal settlement of Matata have been told a managed retreat is the only option because of the danger of another flood. Owners of dozens of properties and deemed dangerous are deemed dangerous uh, flowing, following a debris flow in 2005 and they're being offered market value to sell up after 14 years of wrangling, stress and uncertainty. Residents who refuse to give up their homes could eventually face eviction. Fakatane's Mayor Tony Bond says it's taken so long to decide the future of Matata that some residents are no longer alive. You think about 14 years of stress. Some of them haven't actually um, survived that stress. Some of them actually are now not in the, above us because they just haven't made it. So to me, um, we've got to give an option, and this is an option for the people. Tony Bond says the risk to human life is the reason a so-called managed retreat is the only option. A Northland transport spokesperson says the government's plan to lower speed limits on some regional roads is an admission they're unfit for purpose. The transport agency is proposing to cut speed limits on three state highways in the far north from 100 k's to 80 in a bid to reduce the number of serious crashes. John Bain, who heads the region's transport committee, says if the government's unwilling to bring Northland roads up to standard, that's probably the best option. But he says budget-style improvements have their limits. The transport agency's proposed speed reductions apply to state highways between Moirewa and Kawakawa, Puketona and Haruru and Taipa to Awanui. Jewish leaders have today visited the Linwood and Al Noor mosques in Christchurch to hand over a million dollars raised in an American city for March shooting victims. The money was raised by members of the Pittsburgh Jewish community following the attacks and included $70,000 raised in Australia. Earlier this morning, Jewish and Muslim leaders were taken on a tour of each religion's respective places of worship. New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies Chief Executive Vic Aladef says the mosque visit this morning left him shaking. Unbelievably moving, poignant, profound and, and just humbling to physically stand there, to hear those two imams in Linwood and Al-Nur 
point to this spot on the carpet where a bullet ricocheted. It just, I had shivers. Vic Aladev. The US House of Representatives has approved a resolution condemning President Trump's comments about four non-white Democratic congresswomen as racist. Mr Trump caused widespread anger when he told the women to go back to the countries they came from. Three were born in the US and the fourth moved there as a child. The BBC's David Willis has more details. Every Democrat voted in favour of this resolution and four Republicans joined them, including the only African-American Republican in the House of Representatives, Will Hurd. And uh, the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, got the ball rolling, if you like, by describing the president's comments as racist and divisive and disgraceful. That prompted a rebuke from a Republican lawmaker who actually called for those remarks to be stricken from the record. A scheduled three days of intermittent power cuts is going ahead in Oakune despite a safety notice requiring people there to boil water in the central plateau town. About 180 properties will be affected by the mid-winter maintenance cuts, but the Ruapehu District Council is assuring residents they will have enough drinking water and won't be left without electricity in the evenings. Matthew Tunison reports. Days of heavy rain stirred up the region's drinking water, resulting in the boil notice being issued on Monday. This hasn't stopped the lines company, TLC, from going ahead with work it had planned on the network, which will leave 180 properties without electricity at certain times during the day. Council Chief Executive Clive Manley says there have been a few complaints from people who can't see why the work can't wait until the water is safe to drink. But he says the company wants to get the work done during the school holidays, so it won't impact impact on a local school. This is Matthew Tunison. It's five past six. The Australian netball coach Lisa Alexander believes the Silver Ferns are a bigger threat under coach Nolene Dodua. Australia are unbeaten in their five World Cup matches so far, just like the Silver Ferns, and the two sides meet in their final pool match in Liverpool tomorrow night. Even though the Trans-Tasman rivals are both guaranteed semi-final berths, Alexander wants to maintain bragging rights with Australia having won 11 of their past 12 encounters. Having watched New Zealand closely over the past week, Alexander predicts the two sides will be evenly matched. She says the Silver Ferns are more fluent on the court and appear to be a much happier group, which she puts down to Taurua, who took over as coach of New Zealand in the wake of their disappointing Commonwealth Games campaign. Tiger Woods has found it difficult to glean any local knowledge ahead of his, of this week's British Golf Open at Royal Portrush. It's the first Open in Northern Ireland in 68 years and the first time most of the field has played at the venue. Brooks Kepka is one of the few Americans with some insight, with his caddy, Ricky Elliott, a Portrush native. Woods tried to reach out to his fellow countrymen. I said, hey, dude, you don't need mind if I you know, tag along and play a practice round? I've heard nothing. <laughs> Tiger Woods. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, the Eagle has landed in the final episode of the BBC series marking the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon mission. Back on Earth, I head out to the Taieli Gorge to find out what it takes to keep one of this country's more scenic rail lines running. And then there's Emily Brewer from the Dunedin Wildlife Hospital nursing sick kereru and yellow-eyed penguins back to health on Nights with me, Brian Crump, after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Now the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight tomorrow. Northland to Manawatu, including Coromandel, Bay of Plenty and Central High Country. Showers, some heavy, easing overnight and becoming isolated. Hordle Whenua, Kapiti Coast, Wellington and Wairarapa, fine apart from isolated showers. Possible thunderstorms about southern Wairarapa tonight. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, fine apart from isolated showers this evening in Hawke's Bay. Nelson, Marlborough and Canterbury, any remaining showers clearing this evening and becoming fine. Cloud increasing tomorrow and rain in Nelson tomorrow night. For Buller, Westland and Fiordland, isolated showers turning to rain tomorrow. Otago and Southland, mainly fine. Isolated showers about the south coast tonight and elsewhere from tomorrow afternoon. Chatham Islands, showers some heavy, clearing tomorrow morning. You're with RNZ National. And Dara Stewart is back at 5am with First Up, followed by Kim Hill joining Corin Dan on Morning Report. It's now eight minutes past six. 
Thank you, Susanna. This is Checkpoint and I'm Lisa Owen. A former New Zealander of the Year is taking a swing at the government's Billion Trees programme, saying it's going off track. Two-thirds of the trees funded through the $240 million grants programme are supposed to be natives, but anthropologist and environmentalist Damien Salmon says foresters are overwhelmingly using this fund to plant exotic pine trees. Logan Church reports. Dig, drop, cover with dirt, repeat. The Billion Trees programme is the brainchild of New Zealand First, with an ambitious target of planting a billion trees by 2028. But Dame Anne Salmon is concerned things are going off track. Well, I think the Billion Trees policy is great, um, and I think the promise to plant two-thirds natives uh, was a good one. Uh, but that's not what's happening. From everything that's being said, it's at the moment it's 88% pine trees and 12% natives. But why is that important? Dayman says other countries are doing their own version of the Billion Tree Programme, including China and Germany. And she says they are taking a close-to-nature approach, where forestry is designed around its environment and often includes large numbers of natives. The whole policy is intended to tackle climate change and... There's a global consensus that plantation forests, um, monocultural forests like Pinus radiata, for example, are not the way to do this. That natural forests um, sequester, according to scientific articles recently published, 40 times more carbon than plantation forests, which are felled, of course. Dayman says that focusing on exotic tree species, such as pine, could also lead to more problems down the track. It's not only the case that we are investing in pine trees instead of natives, but the question is, are we going to be able to sell them? The stated intent of two-thirds natives should be adhered to. And I don't know how they've got to a situation where they've got 88% in pine trees. Um, It's obviously something that's going wrong with the way that policy has been executed. But the Forestry Minister Shane Jones defended the programme in Christchurch today. He was in the city to announce funding to help two native planting and restoration projects in Canterbury. Oh look, I don't want to say anything uh, deprecatory of a personal nature about a famous New Zealander, indeed my old lecturer in 1978. But I think unfortunately her article represents a fresh wave of confusion. Uh, There are a whole uh, host of uh, waves, both uh, political, ideological washing along the political seashore that I occupy and unfortunately her uh, facts are not accurate. Shane Jones is confident that the native tree threshold will be met, but says the mood of the private market has an impact on how quickly it is reached. What we think we're doing is that we are expanding the size of the nation's lung to enable us to build a a bigger platform for sequestration to cope with the climate change journey. Now sure, I have a lot of affection for native trees, but the reality is people spending their own money will make a choice to favour exotics and the Crown can fill the gap with natives. It is taking a lot longer for landowners to step up to the plate, although they have a larger grant entitlement to plant Totara Pūruri Manuka, and most of the exotics are being spent to uh, effect catchment outcomes, uh, reduce soil consolidation, uh, improve soil consolidation, and actually very quickly turn around negative environmental outcomes. The government hopes to reach its billion tree targets by 2028. Mr Jones says they should be planting 100 million a year from 2020. For Checkpoint, call Logan Church Tanay. The government's proposing a new road safety strategy aimed at cutting road deaths by 40% in the next decade. The road to zero strategy includes a suite of new measures, such as lowering speed limits on some roads, increasing spending on road safety infrastructure and improving the safety of vehicles entering New Zealand. Hamish Cardwell reports. Last year, 377 people died on New Zealand's roads. If the government's new road safety strategy works, by 2030, 151 in that statistic would have finished their journeys alive. The Automobile Association's Mike Noon says it's a very ambitious plan. And while he's happy the government's put a stake in the ground, it's going to take a huge effort to actually pull it off. The government, if they want this to work, need to strongly invest in road safety right through the life of this strategy because there's a lot of roads that need to have safety work done on them. There's a lot of work to do um, and it's, it's not going to be cheap. Mr Noon welcomes the emphasis on having a safer vehicle fleet 
and the move away from the covert use of speed cameras. But he says there needs to be caution over the dropping of speed limits, as it could hurt New Zealand's rural economy. And while he's pleased about the investment in safety infrastructure, such as median barriers, he says new roads need to keep being built. The large motorway network which has been put in is extremely safe. And indeed, on those major four-lane motorways, um, we are seeing no deaths whatsoever since they've been running. The move away from road building also concerns Topor's district mayor, David Truavis. He says his area is a major transport hub and the government needs to keep laying in new bitumen. Connectivity is so important to us. We go north, south, east, west. Not too many other regions in New Zealand where you have that uh, a meeting point right in the middle in Taupo. So uh, our carriageways are very, very busy. Um, whilst uh, we applaud the message of safety, that's for sure, but there are, we think, uh, desperate physical measures that need to take place as well. Caroline Perry is the director of Breaks NZ, a road safety charity that also provides support to families whose loved ones have been killed or hurt on New Zealand's roads. She says while she welcomes the plan, the government needs to make sure it delivers concrete results. So we know that the strategy is the first step in this, um, but we also need those those action plans in place um, and to develop measures over time to, to achieve the targets that we want. So what we need to ensure is that whilst the strategy is, uh, is giving that overarching um, feel for what needs to happen, we also need those actions. The Topor district has had a horror year for deaths on its roads, and Mr Truavis says whatever happens, something needs to be done. You know, if there's any way possible that we can get this road toll uh, down, uh, we would support it. Having 18 fatalities, 18 body bags as it, li- as it were lined up, I tell you what, uh, no one, uh, just no one, the grief of the families involved, the grief of the first responders, um, you know, if this is a, a road to um, that direction of saving uh, those lives, uh, we would certainly fully support it. The strategy was put out for consultation today and closes on August the 14th. For Checkpoint, Ko Hamish Kardwilaho. It is quarter past six and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Let's go back to one of our earlier stories. This is the Nova Pay issue. Uh, teachers won't be getting their pay rises uh, in their pay until September 11th because of delays with the payroll system. Uh, someone's got in touch to say, I've just listened to the piece on the Nova Pay delay. I'm a teacher, but I find the PPTA embarrassing. The idea that teachers are experiencing a financial squeeze is ridiculous. It suggests that they are spending their money before it is in their account, and if that is the case, they only have themselves to blame. The teaching profession in New Zealand do nothing for their own reputation. And Ted has also got in contact to say the teachers are being irrational over their payout. To think these people are in charge of teaching our children is frightening. Uh, Let us know your thoughts on anything on the programme so far. Text us 2101 or you can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. The Scottish Government has declared a public emergency after latest figures revealed that drugs killed nearly 200 people across the country last year. Substance abuse deaths in Scotland are now higher than any other European country, with drug-related deaths doubling since 2011. In the same period, drug rehab services have been cut across the country. The BBC's Sarah Smith reports. This shockingly rapid increase in deaths means that for the first time in Scotland, drugs have killed more people than alcohol. So why does Scotland seem to have the biggest problem in Europe and by some measures one of the worst in the developed world? Users in Scotland tend to take more opiate-based drugs like heroin and addicts are now frequently taking several drugs at the same time, often mixing heroin with prescription medication and pills known as street valium that actually contain all sorts of dangerous chemicals. The vast majority of those who died had more than one type of drug in their system at the time. A former heroin addict, Sharon Brand, told me she was worried because the users were getting younger. There's three generations of drug users in Dundee now that... um, and when you've got kids that are going about with each other and they're, they're going into different houses and they're seeing what's going on, it, it's right through my community, it's right through it. The Scottish Government has declared the situation to be an emergency and has created a task force to look for innovative ways of tackling the problem. One suggestion is to set up medically supervised consumption rooms where users could take drugs more safely. But drugs laws have not been devolved to Scotland, so that idea is being currently blocked by the Home Office. Joe Fitzpatrick, the Scottish Public Health Minister, says his hands should not be tied. 
I'm absolutely determined to use the, uh, the powers that we have that are at our disposal to make a difference here, but the evidence is that actions like the safer consumption rooms will make a difference, will save lives, um, so I think we should follow the evidence and I really would encourage the UK government to work with us in order to make that happen. Scottish drugs charities complain that treatment programmes currently available in Scotland are not good enough. Nearly half of the users who died in 2018 had been taking methadone, which is prescribed to help people give up heroin. So it's likely they were receiving treatment, but it didn't save their lives. A scheduled three-day power outage is going ahead in Oaukuni despite a safety notice requiring people to boil water in the central plateau town. About 180 properties will be affected by the midwinter outage, but the Ruapehu District Council is assuring residents they will have enough drinking water and won't be left without electricity in the evenings. Matthew Tunison spoke to Council Chief Executive Clive Manley. This was a maintenance operation that the Lions Company was doing and they had planned it for the school holders so it wouldn't impact on the school. And it was just unfortunate that we've got the same issue going on with our water that's coincided with it. So why not delay the power outage until the water issue is resolved? The actual outage is, it goes from some properties to the other. There's not many properties affected by it. So at the moment, we're seeing if we can manage it with the outage because at this stage, it's a much cheaper way for the Lions Company to do its maintenance, to uh, put it down again and then uh, do it at another time when the school is operating. It does inconvenience the school a lot more. So at the moment, the property is affected. Some of them are literally only off for an hour on the rolling. Others are off all day just for the day. So it does vary from property to property. But all the power is back on by the evening. Yeah, but Graham, middle of winter, school holidays... No electricity and having yes, to boil yes. water. It's, it's, I, it's not I ideal would, timing. As usual, when things happen, you, you couldn't get a worse timing for them. And I certainly feel for the properties who are impacted by both. But hopefully the, the outages, as I said, is only a short duration and it is during the day. All right. And uh, any residents expressed uh, displeasure at this? We, we've had a few calls. First of all, when the local supermarket ran out of bottled water, there was a bit concern uh, that those who didn't want to boil water didn't have that choice, but that was quickly rectified. So I think most people are commenting on the same thing that you are, as why it happened both at the same time, but the inconvenience should be quite reduced for those people that are affected. That's Ruapehu District Council Chief Executive Clive Manley speaking to our reporter Matthew Tunison and there will be bottled water available on the corner of Ruapehu and Shannon Streets for anyone who needs it. Um, let's return to one of our earlier stories. This is about a craft store in Christchurch called Lynn Craft. A woman has complained that she was racially profiled while she was in the store with her partner shopping, um, uh, accused, she says, in essence of stealing. The company has denied that it is using racial profiling. Uh, this person has gone in contact to say, it's not just Māori who get racial profiling. Anyone who is not white can be ruled out from being normal. My Pākehā husband gets greetings from shop assistants and I get ignored. I am an experienced and registered primary school teacher. After six years of teaching, I still get people asking if I'm a teacher's aide or a Chinese language teacher. I'm Asian. And Sylvia has got in touch to say racial profiling was alive and kicking in New Zealand. The most obvious were those almost 20 years of driving through New Zealand with my left hand steering wheel black Saab limousine until the early years of the 2000s. My Māori husband was always in the passenger seat and the cops always thought he was the driver and stopped us all the time. Sometimes they didn't even bother to listen to me when I said I was the driver. They did not even want to look when I'd say where is the wheel, Mr Police? please. Also, my husband as a passenger would be accused by a policewoman of causing a traffic accident, would have to go to the courts to prove her wrong. Today, there are more Māori police officers and perhaps this happens fewer times. I do not know. I am a widow and look Pākehā. Matewa says Sylvia. Thanks for all your feedback. Do keep it coming. 2101 on the text. The South African musician and anti-apartheid activist Johnny Clegg has died after a battle with cancer. 
He was born in the UK, but grew up in KwaZulu-Natal and became a much-loved figure in his adopted homeland for his willingness to embrace the culture and the music of black South Africa. The CBC's Lindsay Duncombe has more. Johnny Clegg in concert 20 years ago. By that time, he'd made his mark as a music star in South Africa and was able to celebrate on stage that night with Nelson Mandela. The song you're hearing, Asim Bonanga, was written as a tribute to Mandela in 1987 during the push to end apartheid. Clegg was born in England, grew up in Zimbabwe, Zambia and South Africa. It was as a teen in Johannesburg that Clegg fell in love with Zulu culture. At the time, it was illegal for whites to mix with blacks. Clegg ignored the apartheid laws and learned from Zulu teachers how to dance, how to play the guitar. He eventually became known as Le Zulu Blanc, the white Zulu. During the apartheid era, he helped form two influential racially mixed bands, Jaluka and Savuka. Jaluka hit the charts in the UK in 1979, and Clegg enjoyed a long international career. Four years ago, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He died today in Johannesburg. Johnny Clegg was 66. Lindsay Duncombe there on the life and music of Johnny Clegg. A Northland High School is crediting a drastic drop in violent behaviour and an improvement to its students' mental well-being to a youth worker's unique initiative. Dargaville High's youth worker Mel Russell launched a lunchtime program earlier this year aimed at keeping students out of trouble. And it's just done that. It's done just that, rather. The program has been such a success it's captured the attention of other schools throughout the country. Alicia Foon has the story. I know that they can come to me or I can talk to them. I just I can just notice when things aren't right. It's just having someone other than a teacher or a counsellor that they know that they can trust. That's Mel Russell, Dargaville High's sole youth worker. She's become the catalyst for positive change in the very school she attended growing up by shaping the future of young people from low socioeconomic backgrounds. 15, I wasn't allowed to go to school. When I came to the school, I was, there was only three of us married here at year 11. Like, I can recognise them. Like, I can see their struggle. I can feel their pain. I can um, understand what they're going through. And I've had no qualification whatsoever other than to bring to them my life's experiences. Ms Russell says many students at the Decile 3 school struggle with low self-esteem, anxiety and depression. She found many were smoking and fighting during lunch breaks, causing major issues for staff. So earlier this year, she launched a lunchtime program running three times a week. At first, a handful of students would turn up, but the program, which has created sports groups and provided gym classes, has become so popular. About 50 students now attend each session. Dargaville High Principal Mike Horton says it's been a huge success and a big reason why there have been no suspensions so far this year. The first in 25 years. In previous years, about a dozen students have been suspended each year, mainly for violent related incidents. Students would um, get involved in, in uh, altercations quite quickly and easily and it could spread to another group. I think one of the big changes has been around um, student wellbeing and identity, so being proud of who they are and where they're from. The change is creating a ripple effect in the community and has even reached Northland Police, who have fundraised $120,000 to provide gym gear to contribute to the program. Police have even started their own weekly program at the school, mentoring youth, many whose families are involved in gangs, in an early morning gym session. Ms Russell is part of a network of youth workers with 24-7, an organisation which links churches and schools, providing 165 staff to 75 schools throughout the country. 24-7 Youth Work National Network Coordinator Jay Gaudard says youth workers like Ms Russell are making big impacts through small steps. A lot of her success is down to the longevity of her commitment to their school and her partnership, as an example, the partnership that she's had with the police putting together that school gym where they get up in the morning at 6 o'clock and take kids to the gym and seeing these kids in youth gangs who are actually starting to turn their lives around. 
Mr Geldard says youth workers have the ability to build trusted relationships and shepherd youth when they need it most. But they're saying that they don't have enough youth workers, they want more youth workers, and they're actually um, wanting to see more of this initiative happening in more schools. So many lives that have been changed through having youth workers, schools are going, we need more of this because we see the benefit this is having on our well-being of our young people. Mr Geldard says youth work is crucial to helping students with their problems especially around mental well-being, and says the Dargaville High programme shows just how successful youth work can be. For Checkpoint, call Elisha Fern Tene. Before we go, let's get to some of your feedback. Uh, on the earlier story about drones, this is looking at the regulation of them. Mike has been in contact saying, why is it going to become everyone's human right to have a bloody drone so that they can annoy you wherever you might have just found a, a bit of peace? Ban them, says Mike. I'm sure there'll be a few people who agree with you, Mike. Uh, Don's been in touch about the proposed Basin Reserve name change uh, to support women's sport Basin Reserve. Don reckons if you're conducting any kind of survey, read the name Basin Reserve, my answer would be no change. No in capital letters. The term Basin Reserve is beautifully neutral, says Don, and that is how it should remain. Politicising the name is distasteful. We also spoke to the owner of a teeny tiny house in Wanaka. He's put it up for rent for between two fifty and two ninety dollars a week. It's three hundred, it's three point five meters by two meters. Francine has got in contact to say, why give the teeny tiny house guy such a hard time when he's obviously gauged the local housing market correctly? Let's ask instead why a Labor government is still disposing of state land and housing in the name of public-private partnerships. And Keith has got in touch to say, I lived in a house that. That size for six years. Wonderful, says Keith. For the last 14 years, I've lived in a house nearly double that size. I love it. I think Keith's bucket is always half full. RNZ News headlines at half past six. More than 30 assault-style firearms and large-capacity magazines have been surrendered to the police in Waipu at the first government buyback event in Northland this afternoon. The education payroll is defending the delay in paying teachers their pay increases in back pay, saying the payroll system can't easily make the complex adjustments required. The Fakatani mayor says the risk to human life is the reason a managed retreat is the only option for residents of a storm-damaged Bay of Plenty settlement. And drone unit users could soon need a licence and could have them seized if they break the law. Those are the headlines. Our next news will be at 7 o'clock. Take the pulse of the day's news every weeknight at 10. But a lot of them still don't want to sell their properties and they are basically saying they don't want to leave. Lately with me, Karen Hay, is your late night eye on the latest headlines and the people who are making them. Eight people have died since last week in Kasai.